This barrister's bookcase has been in our family for quite some time. It was actually picked up at a yard sale. Now, these are becoming more and more popular these days, I think partially because people like arts and crafts pieces. These things were cranked out in factories by the thousands. They're actually modular units. This one has a sticker that says it was produced in Cincinnati. Now, barrister is a term for an English attorney. And what would happen is the young attorney would start to buy his law volumes, and he'd want to protect them. So he'd buy one of these modules and start the collection. As he prospered, he would add modules to store the new books. Now, they can often become unstable, so there was frequently a brass rod. This one happens to be missing, which would hold it all together. The mechanism for the front is just a simple brass slide that holds the front open as you replace or remove volumes. Now, if there's any improvement I would make, it would be to make the case a bit deeper and a bit taller to accommodate a larger range of books. We know we can get the hardware today, and we know where to find oak, so let's go back to the shop and build one. Well, here it is, our version of the barrister's bookcase, made out of white oak. I did incorporate some of the changes I mentioned. It's deeper, and the compartments are higher. Unlike the one that you saw at my house, which is modular, this is all one piece. That makes it quite heavy, and you certainly won't be able to move it when it's loaded up with books. I want to start today making a couple lightweight frames. They're made out of plywood. There's two. One up here at the top, which ties the sides together and also secures the top of the cabinet, and one way under the base, which secures the assembled base to the bottom of the cabinet. The way that I actually make those pieces is that over at the table saw. Here are the pieces of plywood pre-cut to length and width, and the joint between each will be a groove and a tenon, which will get glued and pinned together. I want to make the groove first, so I've installed a quarter-inch dado and a featherboard to keep the stock tightly up against the fence. It's just about in the center, but by making one pass, flipping it around, and making another pass, the groove will be perfectly centered. Before we use any power tools, however, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Let's take another look at the prototype. While I'm set up to make grooves, I want to do an operation for the side panels. The joint is the same between the styles and the rail. It's a groove and a tenon. So I want to make grooves in each style and the top and bottom rail. These intermediate rails are just applied on the face. Making tenons on the table saw is a cinch. I simply widen the dado to a little more than a half inch, install my sacrificial fence so that I can slide it just a bit over the blade, and by making two passes, I end up with a tenon that fits into the groove that I machined earlier. To assemble the frames, I put some glue on the tenon and in the groove, slip the pieces together, and then I'm going to temporarily clamp them just for a couple minutes, and I'll pin each joint with some 5 8 inch brads. With the two lightweight frames built, I want to turn my attention to these two pieces of three-quarter inch oak plywood, which are the field of the sides. I want to make a big rabbit on the outside of all these lines. The next step is to make a groove right at the corner of all the rabbits. 
I've changed my setup. I now have a saw blade installed rather than the dado because the dado blade will not come up high enough for some of the cuts that I need to make. It'll take two passes to make a quarter inch wide groove. The purpose for that groove is it gives me a place where I can slide the oak frame of the side panel over the plywood. Just as with the plywood frames, I'm putting some glue on these little tenons and in the grooves of the styles. And the idea is to now bring all these pieces together around the plywood field, slipping them together, and then we'll clamp the joints. Now with the assembly flipped over, I want to position the plywood field. There's a little extra movement in those grooves. I want it to be flush to the top, an inch and a quarter up from the bottom, three quarters down from the top, and three eighths in from the back. Once it's all set in place, I just tack it with some three quarter inch brads. Now I flipped it over again. I suppose I could leave the panel like this with one big flat field area, but I want to give it the illusion that there are three separate compartments, sort of like the antique barrister's bookcase. So I'm just going to put these false rails in place. A little bit of glue on the underside, I'll attach them with some brads, and when it's all dry, I'll sand them flush. While the sides cure, let's start working on the doors. It's meant to keep the books dust free. So Later, I'll put the glass panels in, which will help with that. And they pivot up on special hardware and slide in out of the way so that you can remove the volumes. The joint at the corner is a cope on the rail and a groove on the style. The rails also have grooves that we set the glass in. I've pre-cut stock for those pieces to the right width, ripped them, and jointed the edges. Now it's time to cut them to length. pieces for the door cut to length, I'm ready to start working on the joint. And I'm going to do that over here at my router table with a door making set. This bit will do the cope in the ends of the long pieces. And later I'll switch over to another bit, this one, which corresponds to the cope bit. This makes the groove in all four pieces and the decorative detail. Now it's time to put the pieces together. And you can see all the glue surfaces in this joint. It may be small, but it'll be strong. Okay, now on the clamps, just enough pressure to bring the joint tightly together. Wipe off any excess glue. And then I want to check it for squareness. And the easiest way to do that is to take diagonal measurements. So I have 38 and 7 sixteenths strong there. And 38 and 7 sixteenths strong there, so I know it's square, and we'll just let it set in the clamps. Well, before I quit for today, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to make some dados for these two fixed shelves, and I want to make a rabbit for the plywood back in the side panel. I've reinstalled the dado and set it up for a width that matches the thickness of the plywood. I've adjusted the fence so that everything lines up with the layout marks. Now I've narrowed the dado down, reinstalled the sacrificial fence, and I'll be able to machine that rabbit along the back edge. Well, it's getting late and it's getting dark, so that's it for today. Tomorrow we'll assemble the case, trim out the base, make the top, and hang the doors. Good morning. I got started today by removing the side panels from the clamps, sanding the outer surface all nice and smooth, and we're just about ready for some assembly. I'm going to show you how this is going to go together. For instance, this top frame is going to sit in this rabbet right 
on top of the plywood. I could nail through the top of the frame, but I'd only be going into this thin piece of plywood, and I don't think that's going to make a very strong joint. So I want to reinforce the joint with some biscuits, so I'm going to cut some slots, first in the side panel. Now I've installed an auxiliary fence, which will allow me to cut the slots in the frame. Okay, now we're ready for assembly. Drop a biscuit in, and then slide the piece in. I will tack it with a couple brads to hold it until I can get a clamp on. Unlike the top frame and the bottom shelf, which sit in rabbits, the intermediate shelves sit in dados. So there's no need for any biscuits. There's plenty of support. So I just put in some glue in the joint. I'll tack it with some brads. And hold it in place until the glue dries. All right. Let's see if we can line up the other side and attach it. Now the back, piece of quarter-inch plywood set in glue all the way around. And this is going to add a lot of strength to the cabinet and make it very rigid. The next step. notch by nibbling away the material at the table saw. I'm using my very accurate miter gauge, and I've set the fence to give me the right side distance on the notch. I want to grab one of my doors and show you what happens near these pieces that I've just fitted. The door is going to sit back about a quarter of an inch from this face. It hangs on some hardware that allows it to pivot. As it starts to pivot, this front edge wants to go up, sort of in an arc. If I leave the piece as it is, it just hits. It'll bind up. So I want to bevel that back at 45 degrees. And I'll do that over at the router table. I use the feather board to make sure that the stocks stay tight to the table. And the bit is just a standard chamfering bit. Now some slots for biscuits, both in the plywood and in the oak. Okay, now for the assembly. Glue in the slots, a little bit of glue along the edge of the plywood. Slip the pieces together and tack it with some one and a half inch brads. Now it's time to work on the top. It's a piece of 3 quarter inch oak plywood cut to fit just the exact size of the top of the cabinet. And I want to edge it. I want to use this bullnose detail. And I've cut the stock thicker than the plywood. It'll lap the cabinet slightly, and it'll give the top more mass. I made this over at the router table. I started out with a piece of oak that's wide enough so that I can get two pieces out of it. I've bullnosed each edge. Now I'll rip it at the table saw. Just as with the other plywood edges that I've covered, biscuits, glue, and some clamps.
This is the bottom frame, and using the table saw with the rabbiting setup you've seen me use before, I've created about a quarter of an inch tongue on three sides. Now this will get screwed to the bottom of the cabinet, and the base trim will have a groove in it. That'll allow the trim to slip over this tongue, giving good support to the piece. Well, now I'll attach the frame to the bottom of the carcass, and then we'll wrap it with the trim. This piece of three-quarter inch oak will be the base trim. I've rounded over this top edge and created the shoulder with a half inch round over bit. There's that groove that's going to slip over the tongue of the frame to support the case. I've spent a few minutes carefully mitering all the pieces of the base trim and I've cut some slots for some biscuits. I'm going to put a little bit of glue in the groove set the pieces on the case, and clamp them. You need a little extra brace right at the back side of the cabinet for that trim. So I've cut a couple little blocks of plywood, machined biscuit slots, and I'll just slip them in place, and when they're dry, will add a lot of strength to that base. Now it's time for the top. I pre-drilled some holes in the top frame and put some screws in place. The top simply drops over the edge of the carcass. It laps about an eighth of an inch and we'll secure it with the screws. These little trim pieces will cover the front edge of the side panels. I didn't want a sharp corner on the outside, so I've made a little chamfer using the same bit I used earlier. A little bit of glue on the back side. Set it flush to the plywood on the inside and nail it with some 5 8 inch brads. Now I have to think about glass for these doors. When I machined the parts to assemble the corners, I ended up with this groove. I can't get the glass in the groove when the door is assembled. I need a rabbit. Then I can slide the glass in and hold it in place with a small molding. To make the rabbit, I need to remove this bit of material right along this edge. I'm going to use a rabbiting bit in the router, which has a ball bearing. Now, the only place I can really ride that ball bearing near this groove is right along this edge of the bead detail. And if I slip a little bit, I could fall into the groove, route too far on this side, or I could tip it and then ruin the bead on this side. I found that the best way to deal with that is to take some scrap wood, make it fit the groove, and just tap it in place with a hammer. Then I'll have a nice flat spot against which the bearing can ride. You'll notice that I'm left with these radius corners. I'm going to leave the filler strips in for support and then just take a nice sharp chisel and remove that excess material. To make the moldings that hold the glass in the doors, I started out with some quarter inch stock, rounded the edges with a quarter inch radius at the router table, and now I'll just rip some strips. A little final sanding to smooth everything up. Now before I think about putting in any glass or installing any hardware, let's take it in the finishing room and stain it. For the finish on this piece, we want an old-timey look, sort of an arts and crafts type of look. 
So I've combined a couple different stains, cherry and dark walnut. I'm just going to lay on a nice even coat, let it sit for a few minutes, and then wipe off the excess. To protect our barrister's bookcase, I'm using a wipe-on poly. It will give the piece a hand-rubbed look, yet it will give it the protection that you can get from polyurethane. I put on a coat with a clean cloth, let it dry for about three or four hours, lightly sand it with very fine 220 grit sandpaper or steel wool, tack it off, and then put on another coat or two, and that should be plenty of protection. With the urethane dry, I'm now ready to install the glass panels in the doors, and they're being held in place with these quarter-inch quarter rounds. I'm mitering the corners, and I'm using this tool right here. It's, it's like a guillotine. Picture framers use these all the time because they give nice, crisp, accurate cuts. I cut one end, set it in place, mark the other end, and then cut it to length. And I'll secure the pieces using some hot melt glue. Just hold it there for a couple seconds while it sets. That's all we need. The key to this project is this mechanism. On the antique that I showed you at the beginning of the show, it was made out of brass. This is the modern day equivalent made out of plastic and I ordered it through one of my mail order woodworking catalogs. I made this little guide or gauge to set it in place, slide it tight to the underside of the frame, and attach it with some screws. Now I simply take the assembled door and slide it in on top of the hardware. Push it all the way to the back and then attach it with some screws. Okay, now for a couple handles. Also came from my woodworker's catalog. Let me just a little screw through the pre-drilled holes and tighten them down. Well, maybe this will inspire me to catch up on my reading. And what a great place to store all these books in a dust-free environment. This was a useful woodworking project, and I hope you'll build one for your own home. So until next time, I'm Norm Abram from the New Yankee Workshop. Norm's back.